All right, good morning, everybody. How you doing? My name is Jeff, and I am glad to be with you here on this uh, Labor Day weekend. Listen, I know this is one of three national don't come to church Sundays because everybody takes the Sunday off because they're all going on vacation stuff. I'm glad that you decided to spend it here with us. I'm glad to be spending it with you. Um, listen, I want to start today. We're going to pray in just a moment, but as we were singing that song, uh, that last song, something clicked, a story uh, clicked in my brain. I remember reading one time about um, this uh, this evangelist. He was this guy who would go around and preach about Jesus and share the love of God with people. And um, a couple of like Bible students ran up to him at some point when he was traveling the world. And they said, hey, um, how do we like get revival started. Revival is this word that we Christians use to talk about, like how God can take a bunch of people in one particular region and just like totally save a bunch of people and pull them out of the stuff that they're stuck in and do all these crazy awesome things. And they said, hey, how do we do that? And he said, it's really simple. He said, you go into your room, you take a piece of chalk, and you draw a circle around your feet. And then you close your eyes to pray, and you say, God, bring revival in this circle, that, that it starts here in my life, that, that in order to see a move of God in an area, that, that it starts with an individual who's willing to say, God, I'm willing to do whatever you call me to. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. God, I'm fully yielded to, to the movement and the things that you want to do in my life. And so what I want to do for just a minute before we get started is I just want you to close your eyes with me. And we're going to sort of mentally draw a circle around ourselves. And we're going to pray that God would do something in that circle today. You ready? Father God, we come to you right now. As people who are in desperate need, we're people who are in desperate need of you, and, and, and we're even more needy than we realize, because we're coming here today with, with, with weight that we carry on our shoulders and with baggage that we carry in our hands. And, and we carry sins in our lives that are left unconfessed and unrepented of, and, and, and perhaps for some of us, maybe unforgiven. And so we carry all of these things with us, God, and we just ask today that your Holy Spirit would come and that you would work in our lives, that you would work in my life to free me from those things. God, that you would help us to understand what it means when you say that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, that we don't have to live lives as victims, but we can live victoriously because you were victorious over our worst enemies. Jesus, I pray today that you would help us to be real with one another, that you would help us to be honest with ourselves, and that you would change everything within these little circles so that everything can change outside of them too. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm dehydrated this morning. I think I've been drinking too much coffee this weekend or something. I don't know. So if I get annoying with the bottle thing, uh, suck it up because I won't be able to talk after a while. Um, but uh, I want to start today with a, a story I think kind of really captures this series well. So um, any, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. There's a man who um, has one of my favorite underdog stories of all time. Love underdog stories. Love when the little guy wins, right? And uh, my favorite, one of my favorite underdog stories of all time is uh, this man whose name was Rulon Gardner. Maybe some of you have heard him or the name sounds familiar. Um, if you've heard of him, it's possible that you know him from The Biggest Loser. Um, but before he was on that show, he was actually an Olympic wrestler. He was a Greco-Roman wrestler um, who went to the Olympics in the year 2000 and the year 2004 and competed there. And this is one of those guys who his entire life has been just a series of crazy, insane obstacles. Okay. So it started when he was little. He went to school. He was struggling with a learning disability. He, he just uh, really had a hard time getting an education, had a hard time overcoming that, but he pressed through it anyway and uh, made a very nice career for himself. Now he's motivational speaking, writing books, all that stuff. Um, he once got in a, in a snowmobile accident. Um, he crashed a snowmobile through uh, the ice and went into the water in the middle of winter, out in the middle of nowhere, 
managed to climb his way out, created sort of a makeshift uh, shelter for himself, and he nearly died of hypothermia um, before he was rescued. Like literally, the sh he, he said what happened was the shivering had stopped and he started to feel warm and he knew that death was right at his doorstep, right? He lost a toe in the incident, but worse things have happened, right? And so he pushed through this moment. He survived a plane crash. He literally, a plane he was flying in crashed into this lake. He had to swim over an hour in 44 degree um, temperatures in the water to get back to shore. And then they had to live or survive overnight to the next day when rescuers could once again come and save this guy. I mean, this is a survivor. This is a guy who has been through some stuff. And what he's most known for, though, is in the 2000 uh, Olympic Games, he entered the Olympics um, as a uh, good competitor, but not the favorite. He competed in the super heavyweight division. So you, as you can imagine, he had a little bit of fluff on him, right? You know what I'm saying? A little fluff. And so he was a, a little bit of a bigger guy. And um, he went in there and he competed and he went all the way to the gold medal match. Now, here's the problem, though. The guy who he was facing in the gold medal match was also a super heavyweight, but he was not fluff. He was a super heavyweight with abs. Now, that's freaky. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you can picture it. This big, bald dude, I mean, shoulders as big as my head, and, like, he was just shredded, just a, a monster of a physical specimen. And, and his name was Alexander Karelin. And not only was he strong, but first of all, he was Russian. So, hey, USA-Russia finals. We love that stuff. Uh, in our culture. Um, so he was Russian. Uh, he had not lost a single wrestling match in 13 years of international competition. That would be the equivalent of the Cleveland Browns winning 10 consecutive Super Bowls. I mean, that just doesn't happen. And to make things even worse, he hadn't had a single point scored on him in over a decade. He was a beast. I mean, it, if, if you don't understand wrestling, it's kind of hard to, uh, to, to picture like what that means in terms of the sport that you're familiar with, but it's like going out to the golf outing this Saturday and getting a hole in one every time, like every single hole you're on for the whole week. Like it's, it's just crazy. It's just unheard of. And so, so, so Rulon Gardner goes out there and nobody is expecting anything of this man. And he gets out on the mat in the first period. There's no score. Nothing happens. Um, Karelin is doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but he's not able to score any points. And in the second, second period, they start in what's called a clinch, which is where you start with your, your arms wrapped around each other with your knuckles like that with the goal of being able to throw your opponent. But the rule is if you break your grip, the opponent gets a point. And so they were kind of jostling and trying to get into position, all this stuff, moving each other around. And all of a sudden, after just a little bit of movement, they saw the Russians' hands do this before they came back. And the refs had to talk about it for a second. And once they did, they realized that he had broken his grip. And so for the first time in a decade, somebody had scored a point on this guy. But still, nobody believed that Rulon was going to win. Finally, after a couple more minutes of just back and forth, dueling back and forth, um, Rulon Gardner beat this man with a score of one to zero, and nobody expected any anything uh, of him in the first place. I actually got to meet Rulon Gardner when I was in high school, and, and that story just stuck with me so deeply because just like all underdog stories, we want to believe that in our lives when we're facing impossible odds, impossible things, that we can somehow overcome it. That's so important to us, to have the hope that the things that we believe are supposed to conquer us or that other people believe are supposed to conquer us, that we can somehow not just survive those things, but somehow be truly victorious over those things. And I think you would agree with me that that, that is something that if, if we lost that hope, that all hope would truly be lost. And, and, and the thing is, like, as a Christian, what I know, what I understand now from, from years of walking with Jesus is that that kind of victory you don't get truly in your life apart from Jesus himself. That Jesus is the one who conquered death, who conquered the grave, and if he could conquer those things, and he could conquer sin, that there is nothing in your life that he can't conquer. And, and, and many of us are sitting here thinking about that, and we're skeptical. We're truly skeptical about the idea that Jesus could help us to truly overcome anything 
And so that's why we're doing this story, or, or we're doing this series about King David, because King David's entire life is a story of conflict after conflict after conflict. And some of you are in that situation now, and you're just tired. You're just tired of conflict after conflict after conflict. And listen, I want you to know that, that, that if you trust in God, that if you lean on him, that if you put your faith in him, that like David, it's not that you'll be able to avoid that conflict, but that you'll be able to come through it and say, look where God has brought me. Look how he's moved me from here to there. He has saved me from the worst that the world could throw at me. And I have survived. And that's what I believe God wants for you today. And so, um, you know, I, I want to I start with a little bit of a summary of King David's life. He, he faced all kinds of conflict. It started with his family at home when he was a kid. He was the youngest of eight brothers, and he was overlooked by everyone. He was the kind of guy that you would look at and people would say, he's never going to amount to anything. Nothing. And some of you feel that way. You feel like people look at you and they just don't expect much of you at all. But be encouraged because God loves to use people just like you to do great things. That he doesn't need you to have all your stuff perfectly together. All he needs you to do is to trust him this little bit. And he can make a big deal out of that little bit that you give him. So that's the first thing. People, people overlooked him. They, they didn't think he was going to amount to anything. And then later on, he, he found himself in conflict with, with enemy nations. He was a, a military commander and a leader. And he found himself constantly fighting and people constantly wanting to kill him. In fact, as many of you have experienced, it's not always the people on the outside that are trying to get you. Sometimes it's the people on the inside of your circle, too. And he experienced that as well. He was betrayed not only by the first king of Israel who tried to kill him on multiple occasions. He was betrayed by his own son. His own son stole the throne from him. He experienced the heartache of betrayal. He also experienced what it's like to lose a son. He lost a young child whenever he was, uh, whenever he was still sitting on the throne. One of his own sons died. And he wept and he wept and he prayed for him. I've shared that story with a few before. But I think the greatest obstacle that he faced is the same obstacle that you and I face. The greatest obstacle that King David faced in his life wasn't the things that came externally. It was the enemy within himself. It was when he gave into temptation, the worst obstacles he faced were the sins that he committed. Those were the deepest wounds because it wasn't just someone attacking him from the outside. It was him allowing wounds to occur in here. And he brought it completely on himself. And, and yet we see that even though David was a man who was deeply, deeply flawed, who, who, who at times committed heinous sins, things that some of us wouldn't even dream of doing. He committed adultery. He stole a man's wife. And then he committed murder by having that man killed. He, he committed some terrible, terrible sins, but for as broken as he was, he never, for any long period of time, gave up on God, and guess what? God never gave up on him. And so there's some people here today already who are sitting here, and they're probably thinking, I don't even deserve to be here today. I don't even have the right to enter a church and to sit with these people and hear this message because now all I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to put on my pretend face and pretend like things are okay. But I want you to know that Jesus doesn't expect that of you at all because he sees to your heart. You can hide behind a veil, but Jesus sees exactly what's going on inside of you. And the good news is he doesn't want you to hide it. He wants you to get rid of it. He wants to help you through it and he wants to get, forgive you for it, just as he did for King David. He wants to make you victorious. So today what we're going to do is we're actually going to start from the very beginning of David's story, which actually starts kind of before he comes in the picture. Because David's story starts with this king named Saul. Because King Saul was the very first king of the nation of Israel, way back in the Old Testament days. Very first king of the nation of Israel. And King Saul was a good-looking dude. <laughs> 
all right? The Bible describes him as the best-looking guy in Israel, and he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. So he's tall, dark, and handsome, and when you look at him, you say, that's a guy who could be a king. That's the kind of guy who could be a king, but yet, the, as, as we'll see from the story that we're going to read here in a moment, or that I'm going to explain, these looks can be deceiving. See, what happened was God had said, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and, and give Israel a king. They want a king. They've kind of rejected me as their king, and so I'm going to give them a king. And so he gives them King Saul, and King Saul looks the part. And all the time that King Saul is, is ruling over Israel, um, Israel is at war with this nation, uh, these people called the Philistines. This is where Goliath came from, the Philistines. And so they're at war with each other, and King Saul is leading them in these battles, and some of them he's victorious, and some of them he's not. And, and on one particular occasion, uh, the, the Israelites attack the Philistines. They attack them, but only in a small little battle, and they're victorious. They win, they defeat the Philistines, and they're feeling good. But, but the problem was that because they had done this little attack, they had antagonized the Philistines, it was like kicking a bee's nest, right? Like it feels good for a minute, like, ha ha, I got you bees, until they all start coming out. And that's what happened to Israel, right? They, so they kicked the bee's nest, they won this little battle, but, but the Philistines had gotten fed up, and so they, they sent this massive army, basically, to put Israel in its place. And the Bible says that there were so many soldiers in this army that it was like trying to count the, the, the grains of sand on the seashore, that this massive group of people just came against Israel, and as Israel saw these soldiers coming, their hearts became weak, and their courage faded, and many of the men that were there to fight ran. They turned tail. They fled to another country. It says some of them found caves and rocks they they could hide in or hide behind, and they were just gone until the only people were left were Saul, his son, and 600 men. That was it, against a massive army. And while, while people are fleeing and they're running away, Saul realizes that everything is starting to slip away, that, that all of a sudden, whatever army he had, which was too small in the first place, is starting to slip away. He decides to try something drastic and stupid. Because what they would do leading up to battle is they would make an offering to God. They would burn an offering to God as a way of saying, hey, God, we need your help in this battle. Some of you have prayed that prayer this week. God, I need your help in this battle. But the rule was that God had commanded to the Israelites was that the only people who were allowed to burn these offerings to God were the priests. There was this designated group of people, and that was their job, and Saul was not a priest. And so he's waiting for this man, this priest named Samuel, to come along and burn this offering, but Samuel is taking for freaking ever to get there. And he's getting impatient, and his people are running away. And so he does this, this foolish thing, and he burns the offering himself. He says, I'm not waiting. I know what God has commanded me to do, but I am not doing what he said. I'm going to do it my own way because I can't wait any longer. And as soon as he finished with the offering, Samuel showed up, and this is what happened. Verse 13, uh, this is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. Samuel says, how foolish. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. The man after God's own heart that Samuel is talking about in these verses is David, who at this point in his life is literally just a boy, about between 10 and 15 years old. He's literally just a boy, and God says, I have somebody else in mind. I'm going to go after someone who is truly loyal to me. See, if you're only loyal to God when things are easy, you're not really loyal to God. 
Like, if, if you're committed to him when things are going well, but before the pressure comes on you, you're not really committed to him. Just plain and simple. I mean, we don't like to hear that, but that's exactly what was happening here. You know, some might look at that and say, well, uh, you know, Saul, he was, he was committed to God, but, you know, uh, things got difficult, and then he flipped his commitment, and he became selfish. He became committed to himself or loyal to himself. But I would say I don't think that that incident uh, that caused him to flip, I think it just revealed where his loyalty truly was. He was loyal to himself. He was, he was looking to find a way out, and not the way that God gave him, but a way that he made for himself. And so many of us do the same thing. So many of us do the same thing. So today what I want to do is I want to give you four things. I want to talk about what it looks like to look like a person after God's own heart. What does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? It starts with the loyalty. It's something deep inside of us, but there's, there's a way it manifests itself. So let's just dive into these things. Four things. The first one is this. A person after God's own heart pursues what matters most. When you look at Saul and what he did in that situation, and, and what he did in many situations throughout his life, he pursued selfish ambitions and the approval of other people over God. Time and time again, he was worried about preserving his throne and keeping things together. And, and he only wanted to do what he thought was best for him in whatever situation. David comes along and did the opposite. He prioritized God over his own convenience, over his own comfort, and everything worked out really well for him. Now, let me tell you this. I, I, I'm not a big fan of... Uh, like dog races, like greyhound races and stuff. I know there's a lot of animal cruelty that happens in those, but this is a perfect illustration for what I'm talking about here, about pursuing the right thing with your life, chasing the right thing. Um, you know, you may not know this, but in greyhound races, they don't just set the dogs loose to run on a track. They have to give them something to chase, right? So I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but what they do is they have this little mechanical rabbit that, that they send like on a little line and it just zips around the track. It's literally a little stuffed bunny that has like an orange vest on it and it's mechanical and they send it around the track and the dogs will chase this thing all around the track. That's the whole point. They send it and the dogs chase it and that's how you have the race. Well, there's this funny video that I saw a few years ago of um, this dog race and, and everything was starting uh, as normal. This was in Australia and they, they open up the gates for the dogs to run out and the mechanical rabbit starts going and the, and the dogs are just beginning to hit full speed, just beginning to hit their stride and a real rabbit comes out of nowhere and it runs right into the field that they're running on, right? And it's like, it just zips right across the track, right in front of them and it does the thing that rabbits do when they're in the road too. It runs out, stops, Realize it's made a grave mistake and then keeps going. And, and it's just like the craziest thing to watch. But what I thought was really interesting was when you watch it, all the dogs seem to notice it was there, but only one out of the entire pack left the rest of the group to chase after the real rabbit. And I thought, you know, people must watch this video and must think that 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 dog got sidetracked, that, that he got lost, that he, 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 he got moved off the trail, that he stopped running the race, that in some sense he's the loser because every, every other dog kept going and finished and he did not. But when I watch that, I think he's the only one who gets it. Like all the other dogs ha have like lost sight of the fact that they're trying to catch a rabbit. And, and they're chasing the stuffed thing, and they've run this race time and time and time again. And then there's the one dog who goes after the real deal, and he's the one that looks ridiculous to us. And, and it just makes me wonder, how many of us are, are chasing the decoy instead of the real deal? I mean, honestly, let, let's just be honest. What do we chase in our lives? We're chasing money, we're chasing relationships, we're chasing promotions, we're chasing this, we're chasing that. We're chasing all these things that are secondary, that in and of themselves can either be good or bad, depending on how they're used. And we're chasing all these things. And, and, and my concern for us, and 
for myself as well as for you is that we would chase these things and eventually we would catch up to it. And at the end of our lives, we would realize we spent all this time chasing things that just simply don't matter. I mean, just simply don't matter. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke of how, how his disciples are supposed to be different. And he talked about how, how people of this world who don't know him, they, they worry about things. Specifically, they worry about their possessions. They worry about where their food's going to come from. They worry about where their drink is going to come from. They worry about what kind of clothes they have or whether or not they'll have clothes. For us, in our context, we worry about whether or not we have the same phone as people or as many Facebook likes as people or the same type of marriage that this person has that I don't have. We worry about all these things. We worry, genuinely worry, and want those things from the bottom of our heart. But Jesus says something that's profound and revolutionary that's also extremely challenging. He says this, I believe, in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 33. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and God will give you everything that you need. That is a beautiful, beautiful promise for two reasons. One is because it means I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm provided for. God's got my back and he promised. That's the first thing. And the second thing is this is that all of a sudden my heart is free to pursue the thing that matters most. Men and women who have their heart after God, who are pursuing God, pursue him first above everything else and can know that everything else is going to be fine as a result. That is a comforting thought. Here's the second thing. A person after God's own heart chooses obedience over their own opinion. Woo! A person after God's own heart chooses obedience over their own opinion. Whenever Saul felt the, the enemy closing in around him, he decided to do what he thought was best over what God had said is best. He panicked. See, what happens whenever we decide that we're going to disobey a command of God, especially when it's like a deliberate thing where we know God has commanded something and we choose to disobey, what we're doing is we're trying to take the controls back from God. We're saying, God, I know I've said that you're in control, but I'm taking the controls back because I don't believe that this commandment is in my best interest to follow. That's what we're saying. We're saying, God, I see what you're saying, but this commandment is a burden to me. And that's how Saul viewed it in the moment. He said, look, God, I know you told me to wait on a priest to come, but this is really burdening me right now because you're taking away all of my resources. All of my guys are running and fleeing. I need to inspire some confidence. You're taking everything away and you're putting this burden on me. But I want you to know that that the commandments of God are never burdensome and they always lead to blessing when you follow them appropriately, whenever you follow them appropriately. There's a story uh, I read about a pilot who um, was flying and, and he was kind of new, kind of inexperienced, and, and he got into some fog. Lots of airplane stories today, by the way, so get used to it. He was flying into some fog and, and he wasn't real good about you know, approaching a runway in those conditions, even though technically it was safe for a more experienced pilot. And, and so he, he was flying and he kind of radioed to the tower and the tower is like, it's fine, we'll give you instructions, don't worry about it. And so he starts flying in and he's following their instructions, but as he, as he senses that he's getting closer and closer and closer to the ground, he really starts to panic. And he's like, I'm gonna crash, I'm gonna crash. And, and the person on the other end, the person in the control tower just said, listen, you obey my instructions. I'll worry about all of the obstructions that are going to get in your way. In other words, there are things that you can't see. You may think that you understand that, that uh, you know, you may think that you're on the wrong path. You might think that you're coming to crash. But if you follow what I tell you, everything is going to work out just fine. In other words... I'm not going to lead you into a crash. I'm trying to help you. 
And I believe God is speaking to us in much the same way. That there are things that he's told us that we are certain that he's told us to do and that we've neglected to do them because we wrongly believe that he's trying to burden us when really he's trying to free us. He's trying to help us avoid a crash, not lead us into a crash. And so, so we need to recognize the fact that God is trying to help us in this way. In one point in Jesus' ministry, he says something that's so insanely powerful. I have to just show this to you. It's Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He says this. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I mean, come on. How powerful is that? Like Jesus is talking to his disciples and, and he's, he's going over all these different things and explaining to them the, about the kingdom of God and giving them these, these commands and showing them how to live. And he says, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? And he goes on to give us an illustration. He says, look, here's the deal. When you hear my words and you obey my commands, it's like you're building your life on a foundation that is solid. So if you're a builder, if, you, if you've ever built a house, or I mean, if you know anything about houses at all, you know that what you see above the ground is not all there is to the house, that there's this foundation that it has to be built on in order to protect it essentially from falling over. Because if you just throw it up and just put it on the ground, the ground is going to shift, uh, it's going to move, and then the house is going to come collapsing down. And Jesus says, look, you build your life on this, this solid foundation by listening and by doing what I've asked you to do. He goes on to say, to, to not do what I've done is to build a house with no foundation. But, but so when you have these two houses, he says eventually a flood is going to come, a problem is going to come, an obstacle is going to come, and they're going to batter up against those houses, and only the one that's on a firm foundation will stand. And so many of us, I think even Christians in this room, are, are trying to build our lives on no foundation. We're trying to do it our own way in our own place. And Jesus makes it very clear. He's like, I'm not trying to burden you. I'm trying to save your life from coming to a crashing halt. He's commanding us out of his love, not just because he's trying to get us to do what he's asked us to do. And so a person after God's own heart chooses obedience over their own opinion. Here's the next thing. A person after God's own heart doesn't excuse their sin, they repent of it. They don't excuse it, they repent of it. I talked earlier about how Saul made this decision. He made this decision on his own to, to do this thing that God had commanded him not to. But what I didn't tell you is how when Samuel arrived, how he had every excuse in the book laid out for why he did it. Check this out. This is 1 Samuel 13, chapter, or verse 10. It says, Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him, but Samuel said, What is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash, ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. Did you see how he did that? S Samuel comes up and he says, what have you done? And he says, my men started running, and you were taking forever. And the enemy was getting close, but nowhere in there does he say, I messed up. He doesn't confess. He doesn't deal with his sin. He just kind of accepts it for what it is. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death. I don't want to keep sin in my life. I don't want to leave sin undealt with in my life. I need someone to take it. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus, the Son of God himself, has come to this earth in order to take your sin from you. He's come to not only free you from the penalty of your sin, but to free you from the power of it as well, so that you can live a life that is for God, finally, for the first time ever. And it all starts 
with admitting it, with confessing it and repenting of it. There's a story that I, I may or may not have shared um, a little while ago about this kid who walked 20 miles to his first day of work. I don't know if you guys remember this or not. If I didn't share it, I apologize, but let me explain. This kid, um, he was a college-age kid. He was attending classes. He had all these big life plans, and he had just gotten a job with a moving company. And the day before he was supposed to report to work, 20 miles away at some woman's house to help her move, the day he was supposed to report to work, his car broke down. Some of you maybe have been in this situation before, right? And so his car breaks down, and so he gets on the phone, and he calls his girlfriend, and he calls family members. He's like, can anybody please give me a ride? And everybody said, sorry, not available, can't do it. Every single one of them said, sorry, it's not going to happen. And so this kid could have very easily called his boss and said, look, I don't know what to tell you. I know it's the night before my first day, but my car broke down. I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be able to make it in the morning, hopefully sometime later this week. But instead, he got out his GPS, and he said, how far does it take, or how long will it take me to walk to this job in the morning? And he found out that it would take him about seven hours walking to get to his first day of work where he's probably getting paid like 10 bucks an hour. But he looked at that, and he looked at his situation, and he said, you know what, I'm going for it. So he, at midnight that night, he started walking to work, to be there at 8 in the morning. And he was walking and walking and walking all night long. At about 4 a.m., some cops noted the, noticed this suspicious kid walking alongside the highway, and they pulled up and they said, what are you doing? He's like, you're never going to believe this. And he started telling them their story, and they said, can we buy you some breakfast? And so they bought him some breakfast, and they unfortunately couldn't take him at that time, and they sent him on his way, and he kept walking and walking and walking until finally another police officer pulled up and said, hey, is your name Walter? Word gets around. He's like, yeah. He's like, how much farther do you have to go? About three miles? He's like, hop in, I'll give you a ride. And so he hops into this police car and he gets the last three miles. He gets to the lady's house. He gets there early. He beats everybody else there. And the lady's like, you're really early, aren't you? And he's like, yeah, but I had to walk. And so he explains the whole story to her. And she is just astounded by this kid's dedication, by his, his taking responsibility for his own life. And she, she posted on Facebook, word gets back to the CEO of this company who then buys Walter a car so he can get to work. Isn't that a cool story? I was like, man, that's so awesome. But the reason I tell you that is because if we all took responsibility for our own lives, including our own sin, the way that that kid took responsibility for getting to work, we would all be so much better off. That, that all the things that frustrate us and the excuses that we make for why we can't do this or why this doesn't happen, all of a sudden when you take responsibility instead of blaming other people for why things have happened, everything starts to change because your sin has been dealt with. You know, people say things, um, you know, get caught in some sort of sin and they'll say things like, well, she came on to me. Or, or, or uh, you know, they'll, they'll get into some kind of trouble and they'll say, well, everybody was drinking. Or the ladies in my office all gossip. They drag me into it as if you didn't have a choice. But let's be honest. We always have a choice, don't we? We always have a choice. And ultimately, we're going to do what we believe is best in that moment. And my hope for you is that more frequently, more and more frequently, you'll choose uh, what God has called you to. But the beautiful thing about David, I've, we'll probably get into some of these stories, but for all the times that he messed up in his life, he didn't excuse his sin. He owned it. He took responsibility and said, you know what, God, whatever you got to do with me, whatever the consequence of this is, I'm going to face it like a man. I'm going to take it like a man, and I'm just going to deal with it because you're right. I was wrong. And then God blessed him for then repenting and confessing. Here's the last thing. A person after God's own heart chooses to trust what God says more than what they see. A person after God's heart chooses to trust what God says more than what they see. See, when David was anointed as the king of Israel, it's kind of a funny story because Saul was still on the throne. 
Nobody had heard of David yet. Nobody knew who this guy was. And God goes to Samuel, this, this priest, this prophet who we saw earlier, and he says, hey, I'm done with Saul. It's time to find the new guy. And so here's what I want you to do. He doesn't tell him who he's looking for. All he says is, I want you to go to the town of Bethlehem. Yep, same town. Same town Jesus was born in. He says, I want you to go to the town of Bethlehem because there in that town, there's a man named Jesse and one of his sons is gonna become king. But here's the problem. Jesse had eight sons. And so Samuel shows up and he's got his eyes open but he's not seeing what God is seeing and he sees the first and oldest son and he is tall and he is good looking and he looks like a king. His name was Eliab. And as soon as Samuel saw him, he thought to himself, here's the guy. This is the guy that God has called. And almost immediately God speaks to him and says this in 1 Samuel 16, 7. I love this verse. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Can I get an amen for that? And listen, this is really good news for some of us. For some of us. Because let's be honest. Some of us are really good at keeping up appearances. We're really, really good at showing externally what we want people to believe about us inside. But when God digs into what's in there, it doesn't hold up. See, Saul, remember, was tall and good looking and seemed to have it all together. But when God looked at his heart, he said, There's something missing here. He's committed. He's committed to himself. He's not committed to me, but when he looked inside of David's heart, he didn't see the heart of a shepherd boy. He saw the heart of a king. Listen, you don't have to be into the, into the position. Like, like God had a, a plan for David. He wanted to put him in the position of king, but you can be in, in the lowest position and still have the heart of a king or queen, can't you? Because all it takes is trust and faith in God. God's not looking at the things that we're looking at. And so the story goes on to say that Samuel had each of the the sons of Jesse pass by him one after another after another until seven of them had gone by and they were in out. And Samuel's like, it's none of these guys. Is there anybody else? And Jesse's like, well, yeah, I've got the youngest son, but he's out back watching the sheep. And Samuel said, bring him here. And as soon as Samuel saw him, God's like, that's my guy. Is there anybody here today who, who wants, to, wants to know that, that God is saying that about you? That he's not looking at you and saying, I see the facade, but I'm rejecting you. I can't use what you're giving me because what I can most use, what is most capable in my hands, isn't someone who's skilled or good looking or, or achieved a certain social status or has so much money or is so strong or a certain age or a certain waistline. I can't use that. What I can use is a heart that is fully and completely yielded to me and my purposes. And I will take you to places that you could never have imagined before. And so Saul or Samuel anoints David as the new king of Israel in front of all of his brothers and his family who had completely overlooked him. And it was all because his heart was in the right place. It was inclined toward whatever God wanted. And here's the thing. To become a person after God's own heart, I don't believe it starts by simply trying harder. This series isn't about trying harder, that you can overcome the the, the obstacles in your life by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and believing in yourself, and I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and all that stuff that our culture wants to tell you is true because there are limits to what are possible, to what is possible in your life within you. But in God, there are no limits. They're gone. I believe that God wants us to be like him in the sense that we don't live by what 
appearances are, but we live by trusting him. We live not by what we see, but by faith in what God is capable of. I'll wrap up with this story real quick. I, I had a, uh, an opportunity to, um, to talk with somebody in our church uh, this past week. They were having some family issues and some uh, really tough situations going on at home. And they were over at my house and I was talking to her and my wife was there with me and my son's playing in the other room. And I can't remember exactly what the question was, but it was phrased something like, how do I know God can really help me through this? I mean, we've all felt it. We've all felt that question before, but the question, how do I know that God can really help me through this? And this is going to seem a little bit contradictory at first to what I'm telling you to live by faith and not by sight. But, but I took out my phone and, and, uh, I opened it up and I pulled up my, you know, Safari app and I did a little search real quick and I pulled up this picture and I showed her this picture and I said, what do you see here? And if you look at the picture, it's a picture of the sky and there's all these bright, you know, bright little balls of little orbs all over the place, hundreds of them, thousands of them all in one picture. I said, what do you see here? And she said, she looked at me like I was stupid first and she's like, stars? I said, those are galaxies. Every single one that you see in this picture is a galaxy, hundreds and thousands of galaxies. And the God that created all of that is the same God who is working in your life. So don't you ever doubt for one single moment that he can help you through whatever the worst the world has to throw at you. There's, not, there's nothing that he can't help you through. Nothing. And, and, and so it seems a little contradictory, but you see where I'm going, that when we understand the greatness and the bigness of God, all of a sudden we see our problems and they just start to shrink. That whether it's a Goliath or it's a relationship problem or it's a problem with a nation that's coming to attack us or, or it's a problem at work or it's, or it's our own sin, that, that before God they all shrink and there is nothing to him. And that when you trust in him, that when you put your faith in him, that all of a sudden all things become possible to you, that the limitations completely open up and disappear. And so the question I have for you today, the thing that you need to reflect on this week, is that when God looks at your heart, what does he find there? This was kind of a hard sermon. It was a hard one to to, uh, to write, it was a hard one to preach, a lot of obedience stuff. But when it comes down to it, God is concerned with our hearts. And when he looks at your heart, what does he find there? Does he find someone who loves him and appreciates the fact that God gave everything for us before we could ever give anything to him? Does he see the loyalty? Does he see uh, the joy that we find in him? Does he see that we're chasing after him? Does he see the faith? and the trust that we have in him. Does he see that in your heart? I want to invite you to stand. We're going to worship in just a moment together. But if you could close your eyes, I want to speak to just a few specific people here for just a minute. Because here's the deal. Faith is not just something God, God wants us to have so that we will make it through this life well. Faith is the thing that enables us to re-enter a relationship with God and to be forgiven of our sins so that we could experience eternal life long, long, long after our race has ended. There are some people in this room who have been trying to earn God's favor, who have been trying to prove how good they are to God. And I want you to know that when it comes to God's standard of perfection, you can never be good enough to enter into heaven on your own. That's why Jesus came. He came and he lived a perfect life and he died the death that you deserved and he was raised from the dead, showing that not even death could hold him back. And if you will just put your faith in him, the scripture says that he will forgive you of all of your sin and that resurrection power will live inside of you and he will raise up other parts of your life as well. 
But I want to know this morning if there's anybody in this room today who needs the forgiveness of God. If that's you and you're ready to say, Jesus, I'm ready to trust you. I'm putting my faith in you today. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose for me. I want you to be the Lord of my life. If there's anybody here today who says, I need that, and I'm committing to give my life to Jesus, Tate. If that's you, I just want to invite you right now to put your hand up in the air. Say, I need Jesus. I see you over here. Anybody else? I need Jesus. I see you back there. Anybody else? I'm putting my trust in you, Jesus. My life's in your hands. Anybody else? Let me pray for you. Father God, we come to you right now and we just thank you for the work that you do. God, I thank you that when I am at my weakest, and that when I'm not on my game, and that when I'm struggling in my life, that you are not limited by those facts. That if I'll just put my trust in you and I'll continue to seek you and I'll give you my whole heart, that you will free me from everything that tries to restrain me. That you will be able to use me despite my own weaknesses. And that you will help me to overcome and to be victorious over every single thing that would come at me. God, I pray that these people in this room today would not trust in their own abilities or in the appearance of what's coming after them, but they would trust solely in you and your goodness and your love and your strength. I pray for those that raised their hands this morning. I pray that you would give them a genuine faith that goes all the way to the bottom of their hearts so that when you look at them, you would say, this is not just a surface reaction. They really do love me. I pray that you would transform them and help them through whatever it is that they're going through and give them the joy of knowing that they are forgiven completely by God and they can now come to him as someone who has a relationship with him. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to keep first things first. Help us to worship you with our whole hearts and minds and lives. We love you, Lord. We love you so much, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Sing, I will not.